Hello, everyone. This is Martin Patella for the Life Enthusiast podcast. And today I have the pleasure of introducing to you Romania Dean Thomas. He's the founder and the uh, chief herbalist at the uh, RDT Herbs Company. <laughs> And it is, um, well, let me just do a little intro this way. Sure. We at Life Enthusiast, we have been promoting the Exula superfood products for a long time, since 1989. And we have had Chinese herbs in it uh, as, as components since the early days. Shizandra and... Uh, and uh, Ho Shou Wu and, and many others. I'm not going to go through the names um, because we're going to get into it. But anyway, we have been using them in minute component blocks. Here, we have decided to join forces with uh, Romania and, uh, and show you just how wonderful the Chinese herbalist approach can be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm going to let Romania explain to you in his words, his life story, because it is so, super relevant. So here goes, Romania Dean Thomas. <laughs> thanks, Martin. Thanks for having me on. And uh, thanks for uh, your interest in my products and, uh, and my knowledge and sharing this. I know you know a lot too. So it's always nice to talk with a comrade and spread this great news at such a really valuable and important time for humanity to understand. Um, you know, I, what I believe is helping, uh, well, this will help us take us to a deeper understanding of holistic health and um, start to understand the values of alchemy and, uh, you know, going deeper, uh, basically, mm -hmm. with everything that we're doing. And in this, as the world becomes more and more perilous, uh, we, the, you know, the solutions are presented. And yeah. I think that uh, the tonic herbs are coming to us at an amazing time. Yeah, I actually, just as you're saying it, I'm thinking, oh, I just want to say so much about it. For yeah. example, since 1996, I have been extracting my own. And since about 2004, we have been selling Armas to the world. And yeah. there you are actually selling it and it's or making it part of your herbs. And it's super important to me because it's yeah. not well known. It's not well understood. And yet it makes a gigantic difference how it impacts people. And the second thing is my love of the Chinese, the traditional Chinese medicine, which this is not, but it's part of. Yes. In the sense that I have had the most health success, most repairs to my broken body because I got broken because of mercury toxicity and many other things. And, yeah. and the healings that came to me were largely with people who understood the Chinese method, the concepts. Anyway, yeah. here goes. Please, well, yeah. please tell us how you got here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty crazy story. <laughs> pretty convoluted. Well, you know, I'm actually from uh, outside Louisville, Kentucky, a little town called Valley Station. Um, and so the fact that Chinese herbal, you know, the herbs came to me is uh, kind of miraculous, but it, it happened via a lot of factors that I happened to meet a Chinese woman when I was on tour playing music at 21 and she introduced me to all this and we got married and we went to China for our honeymoon and it happened to go into the Northern Manchurian province, which is the reason we region where the great Chinese tonic herbs grow. And there I witnessed uh, the collectors collecting the, the, the herbs out of the woods and watched the sacredness that they had for their herbs. And then I stumbled into a night bazaar where the herbs were being sold in the late night and I was I saw ginseng roots and, and reishi mushrooms for the first time, and uh, so she was uh, quite impressed too with what we saw. They took us to a lot of herb farms here. It's almost as if they knew my destiny somehow. They were they were, they were getting me you know primed up to get into Chinese herbalism. And so we got back to uh, America. We were living in San Francisco, and we went down to Chinatown and bought a book by a man named Ron Teagard. And this was about 1986. We bought this book. And we started making his tinctures about the same time you did, huh? Yeah. Uh, making tinctures uh, of Ho Sho Wu and this rag and you know mm -hmm. this and just like you were. Um, we must have been on some kind of collective like Akashic uh, consciousness together, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, we started doing that then, and then um, by yeah, 1993. Just, just hold on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't want to gloss over. Like 
you mentioned Mr. Teagarden. Yes. This is an icon in American herbology. So yeah. you had the pleasure of actually spending years at the feet of a grand master. Like this is not a tiny little nothing. This is not to yeah. be glossed over, right? No, it's not because our lineage has a, a deep, deep integrity. And there are certain ways that you, in certain uh, capacities, you can't really skirt uh, learning it the really, really the right way. Uh, it's just not ethical to jump. Uh, and and the, the, the traditional apprenticeship is considered an eight year apprenticeship with master and pupil. And um, well, as I was saying in 1993, I came back to Los Angeles uh, from being taught by my, my ex-wife, all of this. And then I met him, Master Herbalist Ron Teagarden. And so I became his uh, personal apprentice and we call, he called him a tea master. I made all his teas for his special clients, including his wife. Uh, and for eight years, I was his personal um, sidekick at Dragon Herbs. I uh, managed his elixir bar there and took care of all, all of his uh, special customers, like I was saying, um, and learned directly from him. That is the traditional master pupil relationship that has gone on uh, for over 2,000 years, probably about 5,000 years, actually. And I got that. I'm amazed and, and so I'm humbled and blessed that I was able to be next to this great master for that long. And, and yes, I, I believe that he did teach me to carry this in, in a deep integrity that I intend to uphold the rest of my life. Right. So, okay. So from teas to understanding herbs and how they fit together, right? Yeah. Yes. That's the key to the, uh, the brilliance of the Chinese Materia Medica, which, uh, as I stated, it is about 5,000 years old. The very first Materia Medica was written, uh, the Chinese believe, in the year 2975 BC. So uh, that's uh, 2,000 years before Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching. Um, this would then mark the very first written uh, document uh, on, on herbs. It was written by a man named uh, Xin Nong. And so he's the father of our lineage, Xin Nong. But really, this book was probably written by thousands and thousands of men and women over many years prior to that, because the knowledge in there could not have been accumulated by one person. And so in modern years now, uh, the Chinese health authorities who greatly, greatly revere their, their TCM medical system and protect it. And we'll get back to some of that in a while. But they went in and did research on Shen Nong's Materia Medica and found that almost all of the information was correct. And that gets kind of cosmic. Like, how did these people know in uh, 3000 BC what organ meridian the, the herbs go to and all of this kind of stuff? And have designed and already claimed the three primary energies called the three treasures, which what we, I hope we can elaborate on a little bit. All of that is in this book. And so the, he outlined, Chen Nong outlined three, uh, uh, described three classes of herbs. The superior class is called the tonic herbs, and that's what we work with, Martin, and you and I, and, and some other people who are learning tonic herbalism. The tonic herbs are the superior class in the Chinese Materia Medica because of three criteria. One, they go to more than one organ system and benefit. So the liver and the lungs, or the kidney and the heart, and the spleen. Um, and so a tonic herb has to benefit more than one organ system. And it has to have what we call dual directional energy. In other words, it has a balancing energy. And this tunes in with, with the name tonic herb. Tonic is a Greek word that means to tune the strings of an instrument into harmony. So what we're attempting to do is to balance these two forces called yin and yang. The tonic herbs were found to help balance them. Uh, and then the third criteria of a tonic herb is, is it has to be found to be completely safe for all people. We say over five years old, but probably even, even younger children maybe, but we, we're careful about that. So of all, all people over five years old, a, a properly constructed uh, tonic herbal uh, formula or, or herb itself used you know, wisely, not, not abused, uh, should be good for all people. So that's the criteria of a tonic herb, and that's what we work with. So really the tonic herbs are considered like a class of superfoods. All people on earth can take them and benefit. It's the philosophy behind their use that is so fascinating though. Right on. And so, um, okay, so multiple angles. So, okay, here you are in Manchuria, learning how sacred this region is, how well people treat the soil and yeah. the air and the water and mm -hmm. the, the terrain, the terroir, yes. if we will. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. so I want to put this on record that 
China has earned some pretty bad name for some of the abuse of the environment, which they have yes. done. Yes. But not here. That's the point that's great to make up, up front, Martin, uh, for people to understand is that the Chinese, as I said a little while ago, they, they greatly revere their, their, they consider TCM to be a gift to the world. It goes back all the way back into what they call wild history, which could go back as far as 20,000 years. Uh, recent tombs on Earth have found the charred remains of tonic herbs. So the Chinese government today really protects this system of, of medicine and considers it a, a gift to the world. And so they're in there protecting the regions where the herbs grow. And as the propaganda uh, uh, accumulated in the West, the, the, the Chinese uh, products are tainted and that possibly herbs are tainted, they actually counteracted with that with some measures and went up into the Manchurian province where the herbs uh, uh, traditionally evolved. And they have gone back and found the places where the, herb, the regions, exact regions where each herb evolved because the Chinese uh, you know, le legends about it are so old. And they went to those regions and cordoned them off and made them into UN biospheres. The United Nations monitors them with the Chinese government. And these biospheres are pristine places where no chemicals are allowed in the whole region. In America, our organic system, the guy next door can be spraying to, to, to your field. But over there, you have a hundred mile radius cannot be touched. And that's where the, 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 the herbs are collected out of the wild. They're not oftentimes organic because the peasant collectors up there cannot afford to abide by the, the, um, the, UN pro the, the, the protocols of the uh, organic uh, you know, uh, system. But I've watched them, I've been there. <laughs> and they are, these people go in and collect out of the wild and then walk backward and actually fix the path they walk in on. Yeah, yeah in our awesome. world of the Exula Superfoods, same idea. We yeah. have a lot of wild crafted things that uh, don't qualify for an organic certification because to be certified organic, you actually have to comply with an industrial method of well put. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the okay. tiger, uh, we we can never guarantee uh, a product, but we do uh, quality control, and it's my job and your job, Martin, is is as uh, people who care and people who wish to uphold the integrity to never allow ourselves to be associated with something that is tainted. So we're doing the sourcing. So uh, the customer can come to us under that surety, you know, but at the same time, it's really important uh, these days to research where you're getting herbs from. So like anything, there are tainted Chinese herbs, but if you were to go into a Chinese herb shop and get curious about this and go into you find a little Chinese herb shop, sometimes, sometimes you'll find like three bins of the same herbs. Let's say we got Dong Wai. You'll find one Dong Wai for $6.99, another for $9.99, another for $15.99. Well, just buy the $15.99, you know? You're getting that stuff that's up the mountain in those pristine regions. We call this D-Dow, which means from the place of biological origin. These herbs are, are D-Dow. The Chinese government is coming up with a certification program to be able to put a sticker on those certified D-Dow. Um, and so it's like anything. You, you pay for what you get. Mm -hmm. The way I understand plants, they're essentially concentrators. They take out of the environment yeah. specific energies and specific minerals and combine them to create specific compounds, yeah. typically alkaloids and whatnot, pigments. Yeah. And each plant creates a different combination. So yeah. number one, it has to be in the soil to get it in. But number two, it, it's the right plant with the right... Yeah sunshine and uh, weather and wind yes. and all of that that causes it to build these compounds that mm -hmm. a pharmacist would envy <laughs> yeah oh yeah they cannot, we're not even close yeah they cannot and, make it in a lab nature does it and nature does it and the synergy there i mean why mess with it you know if we find a plant that like a tonic herb that's therapeutic there's no need to, to take to extrapolate it somehow you know Right. It's already in its fullness, in its completeness from, from uh, you know, Mother Nature. Yeah. But um, on, that, on that issue, you know, uh, food and, and herbs are classified differently because food is usually grown from a seed and we call it annual cultivar. That means you put the seed in the ground and a few months later you pull out the tuber or the leaf or the flower or the bud and, or the stem and you eat that. And it's still succulent and chewy so that we can masticate and salivate that. 
but, but if you were to leave that plant in the ground, it would invasive elements would take it over. It start the sugars would go to starch, and you know it would it would be taken over by nature, um, and that's because it's been over cultivated by humans. But now herbs are different; they're called perennial plants. So now you have this little herb that's growing up. It's this little sprig that came up in the middle of the Mojave Desert, <laughs> and it's going, oh gosh, you know. And so by by here comes winter. So the genetics of this plant have got it built in for it to start developing protection against the winter elements. Now here's going to come the rain and the cold, and and so the body, so the plant's genetics build protection and and adaptability to all of those various and and, and the plant's phytoconstituents become much more complex. And now some of that now people have asked me, well, can't we just eat that raw? Wouldn't it be better? Well, the thing is that when once the plant has become a perennial. It, it's cellulose becomes hardened like wood, and we call this lignin. Now the plant's um, juices and its medicines are locked inside. And long ago, some brilliant person figured out that if they boil this in a pot, well, they probably looked at the stomach and said, well, that looks like a pot of tea, and things heat up and boil down down there through hydrochloric, you know, through <laughs> peptic acids and stuff. So why don't we just do that in a pot beforehand with this stick and drink it and get the essence? And, and what we find is that, yes, if you're concerned about stuff like enzymes and live food, well, go, go to your annual cultivar, your plant, and get that. But what happens is these constituents, these adaptogens that help this plant adapt to all of the weather and changes that it must live through year after year, those components are called extremophilic, and they survive the boiling process and are actually unlocked. And that's why our herbs become so important. It, it's a co more complex, uh, you know, uh, uh, a body of, of you know, elements involved. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, what I want to say here is that the harshness of the environment and having to overcome whatever it's in, and Manchuria yeah. is not a paradise. Mm -hmm. That's harsh. <laughs> it's cold up there. It's mm -hmm. cold up there. So that's mm -hmm. why uh, it evolved there and stuff. Right. Cold, like, cold loving plants. Right. The point is that the plant is tough and under the stress it evolves and under the stress it creates and builds these potent biologicals. Ramania, there, there are a lot of legends out there discussing or describing how these herbs came into use. Can, can you recount some of these things? Yeah, thanks. Well, in China and in India, herbalism goes back very far. Uh, the Chinese, uh, in, in what they call wild history, they believe that their herbalism actually has its origins around 20 or 30,000 BC. Now this happened uh, when humans first were known to migrate into this region we talked about called Manchuria, China, which is in the Northern part of China, uh, surrounded by North Korea, uh, Mongolia, and Russia. And this is a very clean, pristine area that we talked about. Now humans came in there around 20, 30,000 BC. The reason they didn't come in earlier was because there's a giant mountain there called Mount Changbai. You can see this on the border of North Korea and China. When you follow the border up, the border dips into China and there's this giant volcanic mountain with white snows and a big lake in it, in the middle of nowhere. Now, this mountain is surrounded by indigenous uh, forested mountains from earlier mountain ranges that are similar to our uh, Appalachian Mountains. Uh, mountain ranges that had gone through a few extinction cycles were much older. And suddenly this volcano around um, 800 uh, AD come, boom, blows, blows out of the, of the region and, and drops these incredibly powerful diamagnetic ores all over the earth, from deep in the earth. And, and then it, as that dust settled and became fertile, specifically powerful plants evolved there. They became the tonic herbs that are so renowned. So humans came in there about 30,000 BC. Now the legends go how they discovered that these herbs helped them was uh, the first legend that's known is that um, the people were living around Mount Changbai and they saw a deer get a bone fracture. Now in those wild times, if a deer got a bone fracture, it was a goner. But this deer was seen going and chewing the bark on a certain tree and then they followed and tracked this deer and saw that his leg healed, his bone fracture healed. It, it was amazing. So then they thought, well, heck, and somebody in their, in their clan got a bone fracture. And they said, well, let's go do what that, that deer did. And they went to the tree and got some of the bark. 
and uh, administer it, and then the bone, the person's bone healed up quicker. And they wrote this down on a piece of bamboo, bone healed quicker. And that's kind of the way the whole thing began, apparently. So this could go back as far as 20,000 BC. Now, uh, to, to uh, validate that uh, date theory, the Chinese government has recently allowed uh, tombs up in Manchurian province to be excavated. So the Chinese people were somewhat like the Native Americans. They didn't want their tombs excavated until recently the Chinese government allowed it. And they went into these tombs and found uh, charred remains of herbal formulas that, that they had been you know, drinking tea of, 20,000 BC. Um, and so we know this goes way back, but the legend, now there's another legend how it got started. There were people living around there who had goats and they were, they would see that Every year, right before mating season, the goats would go to a certain tree and, and forage on the leaves and then go into their mating frenzy. And they, so they called this horny goat weed. <laughs> We've heard that before. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pharmaceutical name is Epimidium. Its Chinese name is Yin Yang Huo. And this is one of the oldest herbs known to be used in human history is that horny goat weed is actually a very healthy herb. Uh, it's used in fertility formulas, and it's in my formula, Amarada, and also in my formula, Embrace. So uh, these herbs are, 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 are called yang jingers. They support the bones and the outpourings. That's what the people needed in those days to climb the mountains or get away from a wild animal. And so they weren't sick yet. What they were figuring out how to do was survive in the wild, and they needed to be able to climb those mountains when they were old. And so in time, these legends grew that there were these immortals who lived in the mountains who took the herbs and they had learned so much about the herbs that they had defied age and they were immortals living up there. And, uh, and they lived around Mount, Mount Changbai. And the legends are that these immortals still live there today and that they can fly. They, uh, they got so attuned to nature that they literally can lift themselves up and fly around. They're called celestial immortals. And they, today, they're apparently still spotted once in a while flying around Mount Changbai. But these immortals became the, the uh, legendary characters in our lineage because they had found all of these herbs over time that gave them their support, their purported immortality. So then what happens is the emperor comes up, you know, the empress of the first dynasty is created in China and they're building out the, you know, the, the, the imperial palace down there, you know, and I always imagine a couple of these immortals sitting up on the mountain, you know, looking down at this and going, Hmm, I think I can see where this is going. <laughs> and, uh, and so what happened was the emperors and empresses gained power. And these legends of these immortals that lived in the mountains intrigued them, and they wanted to be immortal. So the emperors and empresses said, hey, let's go up and find those men and women. And, and there are a lot of legends of women immortals, too. And so the, the uh, emperors sent legions out to find. There's lots of legends about, uh, during the various dynasties, about searching for immortals and uh, finding them. In one case, an emperor finds one of a woman who brings her down to the, um, into the imperial palace and makes her into the court uh, doctor, which they, it, it, uh, a lineage of them began, uh, and they were called Fangji. They became the doctors of the courts and they were supposed to be able to imbue immortality. But they got kind of off on tangents and they become, they, they were known as alchemists and astrologers and and, um, and other things that they did, and they were the court doctors. So now, the, uh, another great legend is that the first imperial palace was being built, and they had installed a beam in the ceiling of the emperor's bedchamber, right over the bed. And in, out of that beam, a mushroom grew. And they said, oh, look at that, it, it's an auspicious sign. And so they said, this is, they said, we must give this to the emperor. So the emperor started taking this. This was reishi mushroom, which is called lingji in Chinese. And the emperor took lingji mushroom as a part of the protocol of being an emperor to take lingji. And it, reishi mushroom is associated with the benevolent leadership uh, in many of the dynasties. The, the leaders were benevolent, particularly the Tang dynasty. There was an incredible period of, of a rise of art and culture and science. If you want to see a book, it'll fascinate you about the Chinese inventions. Uh, of the uh, Han and Tang, Tang dynasties, particularly it's called uh, The Genius of China by Robert Temple. It's a picture book that shows you the, the stuff that people invented in those days. But, uh, but the herbalism, you see, the, what I wanna say, uh, get back to the herbalism on this, is that all of the emperors of these dynasties revered the herbs and the empresses. Um, Sh Shizandra, 
was discovered as a beauty herb. So when you see the, the, the chalice of Kuan Yin, uh, Kuan Yin sculpture, and she's holding a little white chalice in her hand, that has an elixir of, of Shizan in it that she drinks for her eternal beauty. And she's considered one of the, quote, eight immortals of Chinese uh, folklore. So now all through Chinese history, the, the, the emperors and empresses, the emperors and empresses wanted uh, to have their immortality, their beauty. And so they, they would seek uh, to find the herbs. And so when, particularly during the Tang Dynasty, if someone found, even from the lower classes, if they found an herb that was that helped Jing or to help with you know, to general health, they could take it to an imperial court uh, and uh, committee and submit it. And if it uh, would go under, you'd go undergo tests, and if it were found to truly be therapeutic, that person's whole family would be given honor. So what that, what that caused was that all of these people, particularly young men, were out searching for herbs and doing all this alchemy to find herbs that could help them ever have more. And that's what fueled this whole thing. And why longevity is the root of it at all. It isn't, the people weren't really sick yet then, you know, we didn't have that kind of disease in those early days because the earth was pure, you know. It was more about longevity, beauty, and it was all fueled by the, no emperor ever burnt books on, on the herbs, on the medical system. It was, it was in consistent development this whole time. Emperors burnt books on smut and pornography and stuff, but they didn't burn the medical books. <laughs> so then in the modern days, yeah, the Chinese government has been very, very instrumental in protecting this whole thing. Exactly. Anyway, so, so you were saying something about the extraction, right? So this is essentially a tea extraction, water boil. Yeah. Okay, well, um, the, we, uh, I, I'm a seller of Chinese what we call powdered extracts. So it isn't just, the, it isn't the powder ground up. As, as I said before, that isn't nutritively as important. But what the, uh, what the Chinese did is that they found ways to boil the herbs in this big pressure cooker. And then after the uh, tea is cooked to very specific times and temperatures, and other herbs are added in, in the end, the more delicate herbs like Shizandra and Althizia are added in the end. And then after it's all done under pressure in a hemp bag, this big thing looks like it's out of a submarine. I've worked on these machines before. And then they, uh, when, the, when the cooking is done, they, they release a valve and the, the super boiling tea comes shooting out under pressure and goes into a vat and, go, and there's a spinning gyro with very small apertures. And the tea shoots out at such velocity that it just goes poof and turns into dust or powder. And that's what's called flash dried. And then that dust drops down and there's a conical hatch down there and they put a bag under there and open the hatch and sweep it in. So now what you've got is a tea that's been cooked for you, but the flashed rice, and then we put it into the hot water and it immediately dilutes. It makes our life really easy. We don't have to have a little tea bag and steep it for 10 minutes. It's actually easier to make than you know, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Right. So this is actually sort of like the instant coffee where it, <laughs> it dissolves and it's all yeah. coffee that somebody made and then uh -huh. dried out and put in yeah. a bag, right? That's so the same thing. Herb. They uh, flash right and then granulated it like that. I understand that this is concentrated at 10 to 1, right? Yes, what that means is that in the past, um, and I, I am responsible for that, that uh, uh, 10 to 1 uh, ratio is to some degree being in the market. Uh, what happened was in, in 2007, when I decided to start selling bulk powdered extracts, everything at that time had up to 500% maltodextrin dextrin in it. Because um, nutraceutical products were sold, you, you, you couldn't buy, like if you bought a bottle of ratio capsules, it was like 20 bucks. So they would fill it a lot of, a lot of maltodextrin in there to cut it because they couldn't make a profit at 20 bucks. And that was the market that I came into in 2007. And I found a purveyor who said they had the pure extract that was not cut with maltodextrin. And I said, what is that? And they said, well, we consider it to be about a 10 to one extract, which means 10 pounds of the raw material extracted down to one pound of powder. And I, and I said, can I buy it like that? And they said, well, I said, I said why, why, are you, why are you providing it this 10 to 1 pure extract? And they said, because you can tell us what maltodextrin you want. You want corn, you want rice, how much do you want, 100%, 200%? I said, how about none? And they went, well, you can't make any money that way. And I said, I don't care, give me 10 kilos. And I bought it. And I went to the Longevity Now conference in 2009 with a little jar of reishi powder, 10 to 1 reishi powder extract bulk in the jar, straight side of the jar. And that was the introduction of this in the marketplace for what I know. Uh, and then some of my, some of my comrades uh, came out with similar products. 
Yeah. But I'm really proud of that. I'm, I'm proud of getting the maltodextrin out. Well, the industry excuse for having maltodextrin is because the herbs can harden in the, in the capsules and they can harden in the jar, turn hard because they're very what's called hygros, hygrophilic or hygroscopic. They love water. They love water to, re, to get that tea back in, in, out of the atmosphere. And they will harden in there. So that was the excuse was that, uh, you know, that, that maltodextrin was put in to keep it from hardening, from yes. caking, they would call it. But what I did is I also came up with a process of adding a little bit of bamboo extract, which is very high in silica. So, you know, those little silica, those little packs that, we, that people put in their packages, that's actually silica in there. And so uh, bamboo is already high in silica. So I thought I'll just add a small percentage of bamboo to keep it from caking. It's been very helpful. Yeah, we actually make a product with tabashir, with the uh, bamboo extract that, yeah. that is super important because it helps the body with building strong connective tissue yes silica is really important as an element yeah yeah Yeah. okay so so you have figured out the caking problem so it stays stays uh what's the word to some degree powdery people who live right by the ocean will and don't and they don't if you you stir it that's all that's all (laughs) yeah okay and so the usage is what take a half a teaspoon of the mix or three quarter of a teaspoon of the mix pour it Three quarters of a teaspoon is is a is a therapeutic uh, amount for your day. You could do that once, twice a day. Um, and as I said earlier, tonic herbs are not considered medicine. They're just kind of they, they just build you slowly. You feel more adaptable to stress, more resilient against the elements. Um, we can assist your metabolism. We can assist your mental alchemy. We can assist your sense of feeling at peace. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so here we have you've actually created a line with. 15 is it or is it 16 mm-hmm. specific mixes yeah. Yeah. we're listing all of them and um, let's just try and describe when and how one would use this versus that yeah and, and why. well one, one of my most ad- one of my most popular basic formulas that I would love to have everybody on earth to have is a adapt- is a, is awakened my formula awakened and um, this formula contains the top adaptogenic herbs in the world. So I mentioned adaptogens earlier, and most of these tonic herbs have adaptogenic properties, but there are specific tonic herbs that have, that have been termed adaptogens because their genetics and biochemistry are, have, have learned to be so adaptable. For instance, rhodiola rosea, and I use rhodiola crinulata from the Himalayas. This plant endures incredible intense uh, you know, uh, uh, different differences in, in weather every single day. And its adaptogens are so profound that in 1947, a doctor was asked to go look at the people who lived in this region of Northern China, uh, a Russian doctor named Lazarov, because these people were surviving these incredibly harsh winters. So Lazarov and his team went up there and found that they were taking the rhodiola, which they called rose, the golden root. And he then took it back to Moscow and found that it was indeed rhodiola, uh, rosea, which he named because it smells like roses. It's a beautiful smell. Um, and then he did, they did tests in Russia on it and found that it had this effect on our balancing our circadian rhythms and helping our adrenals adapt to stress. And so Lazarov coined the term adaptogen. He was also studying Siberian ginseng at the same time, which is now called the Eleuthero, is its uh, official name. And those two herbs were the, were the first adaptogens. So then the Chinese looked at this and, and, the, and the Ayurvedics, um, and they, they found other adaptogenic herbs, astragalus, schizandra, reishi. There aren't many. Um, but uh, so my formula, Awaken, is what I was talking about, contains the top adaptogenic herbs of all, gynostone, a, a, a great uh, ginseng alternative. Uh, as ginseng gets... Uh, over decimated, we can use gynostemin in formulas. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, astragalus, rhodiola, eleuthero. And then I put lion's mane in this formula and polygonatum siberica, two herbs that are great for brain health. So I consider this a thinkers and a multitaskers formula. People who are students, people who are getting ready to go on a job interview, you know, to take some awakening. Uh, a great morning alternative to, you know what, <laughs> that people drink in the morning. Um, so you're still on the awaken, are you? Yes. All of this about this one thing. Yeah. So it's yeah. essentially the universal mm, goodbye coffee. Try awaken. Yeah. And the surprising thing is, it tastes really good. 
You put it in a cup of hot water, maybe add a little nut milk and honey if you want. A phenomenal elixir in the morning to, to keep you going through your day and to replenish our adrenals. You know how much adrenal exhaustion is just a, a wiping out the health of our society in so many ways, making yeah. us so vulnerable to stress, keeping us from living our excitement, our joy, and our adventure. So these adaptogenic herbs actually sort of like help us put on that new shirt of adventure. Let's go. Let's go out and climb that mountain. <laughs> I want to do that new painting. <laughs> yeah, I want to butt in here just to stress the, or enhance the point, which is the adaptogen isn't that the plant is adaptable. It is that what's in the plant helps you adapt yourself to the stresses of life. It yes. raises that which is low and lowers that which is too high. It helps yeah. you cope with the world better yes. than you have coped before. That's yes. the point of the adaptogen. I know it. And what an amazing time for us to be hearing about this as, as constant stress. You know, Hans Seel, the guy who coined the term stress, he said that, the, that no uh, vertebrate organism, at least, <laughs> uh, no mammal he, that he knew of, can, can adapt to constant stress. We're not built for that. We're built to react to acute stress triggers and then be able to laugh it off at a rest. Now we're under this constant stress. So what the Chinese health authorities say, that the great masters in our lineage say, that when we're under that stress, we're leaking, leaking out our vital energy. This energy is called gene. It's our, it's our inherited energy from our ancestors. It's our children. It's an epigenetic energy. And the adrenals are the valve that lets us use some of that when we're under stress. We're using some of that gene. But what happens when we're constantly under stress is we're leaking it out. And people, we're, we're aging. It's causing us to age again, this constant stress like this. Um, the adaptogenic herbs help sort of like plug the leaks, they say, <laughs> and help us re refill this wellspring of our vitality that is our kidneys. And when, when our kidneys are, are, are strong and full, full of this energy called gene, we age gracefully and youthfully and adaptably. And we seem, uh, we seem you know, curious. Uh, we're still interested in life as we age. This is a great gift. Indeed. Okay, so awaken. That should be yeah. in everybody's cupboard. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, discussing gene a little further, my formula called eternal gene has all of the very top herbs that tonify gene, that nourish the kidneys and nourish the longevity forces. We're going to pass this on to our children. It's really important to rebuild that health. If we really want to experience excitement, adventure in our lives and feel that we, at the end of our lives, feel our lives were full and happy and robust and maybe even, you know, pass through this world without disease, if our diet is healthy too, wouldn't that be nice? Well, the tonic herbs go to the kidneys and help us with this resilience. Uh, so eternal gene is my uh, formula of the very top herbs in the world, the tonified gene. Uh, Hosho Wu, Ramania, Shizandra, Astragalus, Reishi, Euconia, a wonderful, wonderful formula. All right. So, okay. So I don't think we should really try and uh, take five minutes on every one of the herbs yeah. because this talk will be endless. But I want to just highlight, so there will be something for people who find themselves underperforming in the libido department. Yes. There's something for circulatory health and fitness. Go, you go through it. Well, yes. I, I, you know, I always think of economy. How can we create, uh, get, get as much in as little as possible to make it easy for people? So I have a formula for women during uh, reproductive years to help build and tonify the blood, nourish chi. Uh, uh, for nice weight management and good uh, metabolism. And this formula also has herbs for beauty and for fertility. And it's called Essentia, a great formula for uh, women, young women in, in, in reproductive years. And then women who are starting to go through the shifts into premenopause pre and beyond, I created a formula called Phoenix, which is my most popular formula. And it helps with hormone support, helping progesterone, bone density, spiritual uh, you know, strength and, and atoning. This is a very popular formula, mm -hmm. uh, Phoenix. And then yes, for uh, men, I have one called endurance. So anyone who's an athlete, a great formula, cordyceps, uh, uh, yeah, a cystonch, all of these wonderful herbs. 
And then I have herbs for spirit. Uh, we, the one thing I love about our lineage is that we don't forget. In fact, a third of the emphasis on our health is placed on where are we at spiritually? How are we feeling in our lives? And so I created a formula called Shift. It's probably my favorite of all my formulas. This is an amazing peace formula for peaceful mind, a peaceful countenance, and evolution of the spirit. Mm. I think we need to send a barrel of that to the White House. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that and the man's under some stress right now. <laughs> he needs some. Yeah, well, you know, I'm just thinking in general. The the people who are drinking these teas are probably going to be acting a, in a little more ecological manner, right? Yes. Um, you know, the thing about reishi mushroom that's one of the primary herbs that I work with in all my formulas and shift is that that's the we call the emperor herb in there. A reishi is called the herb of spiritual immortality. It's also called a bridge between earth and heaven. Um, it does reconnect us to the totality of everything. And that's where I think humans need to go now as we enter into a, a new era, which I associate with the heart chakra, giving back to the planet what we took. We've been in a third chakra consciousness for the last 150,000 years. That's mindlessly burning and consuming. Now we are evolving into an energy associated with the heart. So the reishi, now, reishi has five different colors, but the one that is showing itself to us and showing up all over the world right now is the red one, which the Chinese always associated with the heart. It's called Ganoderma lucidum, and its name is for its shiny surface, but I always like to think of, well, it's also, it, it brings lucidity. This herb is an amazing herb to have during this evolution to replug us back in to, to the earth, which is what we must do in order to survive the coming future. And if, 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 if we want to put it in a different way, we must do it for the sake of our children. It's our obligation to help our children. The reishi mushroom is a key that is coming to us to open us back up. And the mechanisms of reishi is that it mycelinates into the ground and its fruiting body is basically its sexual apparatus. But, that, but when we take it, it's like, I, I always felt like it, I'm kind of mycelinating back into y'all and everything. Oh, you and, mean like returning nature, back to, to the connection with nature? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that is a great gift to have that for us now. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Um, so the bottles, they come in 90 gram or three ounce, mm -hmm. which, what, what does that amount to? Maybe about 30 servings? Yes. It should be around a month's worth. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, a person can always take more. I had my big breakthrough when I took a lot of reishi. Um, I remember the bottle said to take nine to 12 capsules a day. I took 15 and I just something intuitively said that and I had a breakthrough, you know, all that much sooner, but really the, uh, the amount that's listed on the bottle is, is, is a nice therapeutic ratio for you to take. In other words, what I'm saying is you can have two cups a day if you wanted to, um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> can you mix and match? Can you decide to yeah. just take two or three or four of them and just make Thank you for that question. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't overlook that. The, the tonic herbs are, I like to think of them as kind of like a big salad bar, really. You know, if you go to the salad bar, you're not just going to get radishes and arugula. You know, you're going to get like, and uh, the tonic herbs can be treated like that as long as we have an alchemist like yourself and me to help do a little guidance. And then people kind of get this really quickly too. So a formula like Awaken could be taken with any of the other formulas. Awaken and Essentia for women. Awaken and Endurance for men. Awaken and Shift for incredible mental uh, clarity mm. and spiritual breakthrough um i have a formula called embrace that is for lovers to share but that form is, is an anti-aging gene kidney gene tonic and beauty tonic could be taken by anyone but you could mix that with allure my beauty product and you have mm -hmm. an amazing combination for uh, so i'm thinking that there would be some that are better to take in the early part of the day and some in the latter part right well the tonic herbs are great in the morning to get you going um Adaptogenic formulas like Awaken could be taken morning and evening because the, one of the mechanisms of an adaptogenic formula is it's, it works with your circadian rhythm. So it can actually help you wind down in the evening and rest. Uh, most of my formulas, though, like say endurance, my athlete's formula, better in the day. Yeah. But I have a formula for cleansing called the sin that's better to take at night before you go to sleep. And all that's, you know, listed on the, on the, on the instructions. Great. What do you think? Have I failed to ask you some more important points or have we covered it? I would say we're, we're pretty good. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I know we'll both think of something after we shut down. Of course we will. But, um, but we're not overloading our, our viewers this way, you know. Yeah, I don't want to say so much that you would be bored. I want to say enough that you would be interested and inspired to yeah. Um, yeah. to look into this further. This mm -hmm. this uh, body of work represents a lifetime of research and lifetime of understanding. Like when you're first starting out as an apprentice, you, you're picking little things up and you're wondering, I wonder what this does or fits with that or whatever. What you're getting here with this uh, line of herbs is the experience of a master yeah. downloaded to another master, downloaded to another master and presented in, in a matter that says uh, these things together yes. will work better than you just going into the pantry and picking randomly something off of the shelf. It's really true. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've given lectures before. I've, I've used this analogy. So um, the tonic herbs are so exciting that when people first discover them, they go, my God, this is incredible. And, and you get a lot. You actually a lot downloads like right away about what we're talking about. Um, and then you go, I want to tell everybody about this. Right. And so a year later, you go, you're still working in it. You know, maybe you're studying with a master. And a year later, you go, wow, I'm really getting my feet into this. This is amazing. I never knew how deep this is, right? Two years later, you go, oh, my God, this is so incredible. I got to tell the world. I got to tell the world about this. Three years later, wow, I'm okay, man. This is like now, now I want to tell the world, right? Four years later and on and on, right? Mm. And it, by the eighth year, you go, That was a that was a very cool picture. Glad you showed it. Yeah. <laughs> by by the eighth year, you go, hmm. and that's when you get it. <laughs> no, that's very good. But I, I don't know if maybe my statement didn't uh, resonate well. But what I'm trying to get at is that these combinations are not just some random ideas. They have been tested in many generations. Yes, and they are yeah. well thought out. And so, when you yeah. when you take these products, you will very likely be shifted gently but firmly in the direction that this thing is um, going to yeah. take you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. When, when taken along with a healthy diet, the tonic herbs can be miraculous in helping balance out your life and open up your your life's potential. Right on. Okay. Well. This has been uh, Martin Patella and Romania De Dean Thomas, master herbalist of the Chinese kind <laughs> and, and uh, life enthusiast. If you're listening to it without video, you can reach us at www.life-enthusiast.com. The whole line is under RDT Herbs. And uh, you can reach me by phone at 1-866-543-3388. Thank you very much for being here with us.